The works of your apostles and their faithfulness, Lord, we pray that this would be impactful to us, that it would bring confidence to us, that we ask that you would give us the same spirit, Lord, the same courage, the same zeal for your name that these men and women in the early church had. Lord, we pray you'd use your word to that end, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Acts chapter 5, if you want to pick up there in your Bibles, we left off in verse 16, so we'll pick up in verse 17 this week. Now, Acts chapter 5, verse 17 and following is a little different than what we've been seeing in the book of Acts so far. There's not really three nice little sections um, made up for us as we've had the privilege of having so far. It's really just from this point to the end of the chapter, it's just a really quick moving narrative. Um, Eckhard Schnabel, I don't know if anybody's heard the name Eckhard Schnabel. He's, I think, now maybe my favorite Acts commentator. I've got a couple commentaries on Acts. I think he's my favorite. Uh, he's a professor at Gordon-Conwell up in Massachusetts. But he notes in his commentary 17 different point of view changes or, 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 or like character changes, 17 changes just in this little section here. So it's a bunch of different um, transitions from different people speaking to different scenes. It's, it's, it's really quick moving section. So, and as I said, it's like one, it's one big section really. Uh, the ESV doesn't add a lot of headings in these or, or, or even break off a lot of paragraphs. So here's the structure I'm going to try to provide for these verses here. Number one, we're going to see the rearrest and the escape of the apostles from prison. And I'm saying rearrest because if you remember back in chapter 4, they've already been arrested before. Now they're being rearrested. Uh, secondly, we're going to see uh, a subsequent re rearrest of the apostles. They're going to get arrested again. Then we're going to see Gamaliel's argument, or I think the ESV calls it the Council of Gamaliel. And then lastly, we're going to see the re-re-release of the apostles followed by their continual work to spread the gospel. So, kind of four little sections here. There's not a lot of like technical issues that I came across in the Greek or anything. It's, it's pretty uh, quickly flowing. There is one kind of significant issue concerning the question of biblical inerrancy that we're going to look at. Uh, there's some debate that comes up uh, in one little section here. We'll, we'll, we'll stop and, and notice that. But really, we're just going to do what we normally do. We're going to walk through the text. We're going to make some applications. You all free to interact as much as you like. So let's begin. The apostles are rearrested and their miraculous release. Verse 17. It says, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them into public prison. The high priest rose up and all that were with him. And what, what's the great evil that's going on that's causing the high priest to need to raise up and address these apostles. Well, if you look back at verse 12 and following, some of the atrocities that the apostles are committing are mentioned here. For instance, in verse 12, it says, Many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. Verse 15 says, So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and they laid them on coats and mats that as Peter came by, at least maybe his shadow might fall on some of them. And all were being healed. So there's no evil going on here, just good deeds performed by the apostles. And the text actually tells us here that the motivation for the, for the raising up of the high priest and the Sanhedrin here is a motivation of nothing more than simple jealousy. They're jealous of the apostles and I thought that was kind of interesting that the Bible tells us that because remember that the book of Acts in particular is not simply church history. We actually have for us inspired church history. And so we actually get insights and clues into things like P 
people's motivations for why they do things. I mean, how would we know the motivation was jealousy? God knows their motivation was jealousy, and he puts that into the scripture for us. So we get insights that just a normal history or normal church history doesn't give us. We get inspired church history in the book of Acts. Now, they're jealous because the, the Jewish leaders love their prominence in the society, like Jesus says. They love being the leaders. They love their special place amongst the people. They love their greetings. But now the, the people are looking elsewhere for their spiritual le uh, leadership, their spiritual um, direction. And so they feel like they have no choice but to arrest these perpetrators of good. So they're going to arrest the apostles, but the Lord would not have it be so easy, so simple. Verse 19, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and they began to teach. Now, when an angel of the Lord appears and lets you out of prison and gives you instructions, uh, you respond, you obey, and you don't sleep in. It says that they, at daybreak, they entered the temple and they began to teach the people. And what were they to teach? Well, it's a very, I think it's a very interesting phrase that the angel speaks here. It says that they're supposed to teach all the words of this life, all the words of this life. Now, I kind of just thought, as I, as I thought about that, the reality that the call to the church is not simply to preach the gospel message in a sense of, of the gospel message that we preach to convert sinners or, or just to, to get them justified. Um, the call for the church is actually to preach all the words of this life, and we kind of see that happening in, in a couple different instances. So you may have some people in the church who are kind of dedicated to that, that outward call of the gospel where, by which people get saved. But God has put into his church people like pastors and teachers to, to further that kind of aspect of discipleship where you get all the words of this life. When we go out and do evangelism, we're not getting into the minutia of some of the details of scripture, right? But, but that is a job that is to be done by the church. We are to fully open up the word of God for his people. And I thought about how Paul was able to rest in the fact that he had fulfilled his ministry in this way. Uh, in Acts chapter 20, as he's speaking to the Ephesian elders, he's able to say this. Paul says, therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So Paul had done this. Paul had taught all the words of this life. And I think this is a perfect example, this phrase given by the angel is a perfect example by what we do here, by verse by verse exposition of books of the Bible is so good and so right. Um, because if you don't do that, it's really hard to teach all the words of, the li of this life if you're not teaching all the words of this life. Um, and we've all kind of seen how there can be, it can be problematic simply to do topical messages or simply to do bits and pieces. But we want to teach all the words of this life, just as the angel commanded the apostles here. Now, pick up in the second part of verse 21. I'm going to read a good section here. Now, when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the synod of the people of Israel, and sent to prison to have them brought. So they're, trying, they're, they're calling to bring the, the apostles out of the prison here. They're going to call them to the, before the council. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison so they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked, the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And then someone came in and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. 
Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. So I think we have a kind of awkward situation that these leaders find themselves in here with the apostles. They've already, in a sense, kind of flexed on the apostles by arresting them again. And now they can't seem to explain or understand how these miracle workers have escaped from the prison. Right? How did these miracle workers escape from our prison, they're asking themselves. Right? Strange situation to be surprised that the miracle workers are gone. Um, so you have to kind of picture the scene, that, and it's really a strange one for these leaders. They, they need to arrest the apostles. They want to convince them to stop preaching Jesus. But they're dealing with a couple of different aspects, of, of, of a couple of different problems here. They have the supernatural problem, the supernatural working of the apostles, and, and the obviously supernatural nature of their ministries. And they have this natural concern, you could say, the concern for the people, that the people might stone them. Now, at least these leaders are, are in a sense, kind of moving a little more cautiously with the apostles than they did it at first. Now, I imagine they're coming up to the apostles like, uh, guys, can you please, a lot of pleases, a lot of, if you would be so kind, please come back with us, right? They're, They're really on their heels at this point. And so... You have to kind of imagine the reality of being afraid to be stoned to death by the people. Here it says the captain with the officers go and retrieve the apostles. The the leaders themselves don't even show up. And to me, the interesting thing that Luke notes here is the leaders aren't so afraid of the supernatural repercussions or aspects of the apostles' ministry. They seem to be more worried about just the natural reaction of the people. They're afraid of being stoned versus, hey, these miracle workers, I'm opposing these miracle workers. You would think they might be more concerned about the implications of that. So really, it's just a picture of the ultimate fear of man as opposed to the fear of God. So We have the the re-re-arrest now of the apostles. The apostles are obviously willing to go this time. They're not brought by force. They're willing to be brought into custody and be brought before the presence of the Sanhedrin, this Jewish council. Verse 27 says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you, attend, you, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, I, I kind of hear the high priest's tone being like, come on, man. We told you not to teach in this name. Like, who, we're the Sanhedrin. Who doesn't listen to us? Like, how are you guys still doing what we warned you guys and commanded you guys not to do? But I love the description of the work of the apostles that they mention here. He says... You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Now, when and if you have the authorities or the government kind of describing your uh, evangelism like this, you know you fulfilled your duty. You know you're doing a good work when people say, you filled the whole city with this teaching. And they've obviously been very explicit about their teaching. These Jewish leaders feel the weight Uh, in in the explicit nature of uh, them preaching and how they're preaching the death of Christ because they say, you intend to bring this man's death upon us. The apostles are saying, you guys are accountable for the sin or for the, uh, I'd say, the blasphemy of the crucifixion of your Messiah. You are guilty for that. And they don't like being told that. And so the call from these leaders to the apostles is to stop. Stop teaching in this name. They don't even say the name. The leaders don't ever mention Jesus' name throughout this section here. They just say, stop teaching in that name. They don't even want to say it. So the call is to stop teaching. The response from the apostles is a famous one. It says here in verse 29, But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man. We must. They are unapologetic. 
about what they are to do. Now, this scenario the apostles find themselves in is inevitably a situation to one degree or another that every Christian will find themselves in. This, this conflict between the world, between God, is going to come up at some point or another. And when you are presented with this decision between doing what God says or doing what man says, and if these two things are in conflict, well, the good, the good news is that for us, there is really nothing to think about. The decision is an easy one. We do and we must obey God rather than man. And so I think as we come across, and this isn't the first time the, the apostles have given an answer like this. Remember last time they said, judge for yourselves which is, which is right. Obey God or man. So this is a, a common theme and a common predicament the apostles are finding themselves in, but I think as we keep coming across these, and I think that's what the book of Acts is, is obeying God rather than man, um, as we keep coming across this kind of repetitive situation, all that God is just calling us to renew our commitment to have ourselves ready, our families ready, so that when we're put in this situation, we don't even think about it. Our, our natural reaction is to obey God rather than men. I mean, that's why, that's why God has us like here right now reading this is to prepare ourselves for the future. That's why we're here is to see this and to um, see the apostles as our example for this conflict between God and man that is the Christian life. So we should take it as that. We should see the faithfulness as the, of the apostles we should want to emulate that, and we should just be right now renewing uh, ourselves and our commitment to the Lord, saying, when the time comes, Lord, we'll obey you rather than man. You want to be prepared for something like that. You don't want to get caught on your heels when something comes up and you're not sure, like, well, do I really need to? I mean, this is, this is why these scriptures are here for us. Now, the apostles go on to kind of explain why, they're, why, they're, why they have this conviction, why they're so constrained to speak so boldly and so unap unapologetically that there's really no doubt in the minds of the apostles about the reality of what has been occurring there in Jerusalem. There's no doubt in their minds about what God has accomplished through Jesus Christ and what the response of man is to be to this revelation. And so... Here is their explanation of why they cannot stop preaching Jesus. Verse 30, their explanation. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, I kind of refer to this as the, the apostles' explanation um, for their conviction. But you could kind of say this is their apologetic. This is their reason, their reasoning, their defense, their argument for this faith that they have, this commitment that they have. Their answer is this, this Jesus whom you crucified was raised from the dead by God himself. And we are all witnesses of this. But they also say not only are we witnesses of this, but the Holy Spirit of God himself is witness to these things. The Holy Spirit of God, this one, this, this one who has been poured out on those who have obeyed the gospel... Can you think of a better witness to have in your court case than the Holy Spirit of God? It's case closed, in, in other words. Now, just in passing, and I don't want to make too much out of this because it is just a passing comment, and you really shouldn't build too much theology in, on passing comments, but I did want to note here just how naturally flowing the description of what we call the doctrines of grace is seen here in how the apostles describe repentance being a gift of God, that God gives repentance to Israel. It's there in verse 31. 
Um, it's very similar to the language that we see in, in Ephesians 2, 8, for instance, that famous passage where Paul describes faith, our faith as being a gift of God. And so we have repentance being described as a gift of God. We have faith being described as a gift of God. Repentance and faith are gifts from God. And this is, this is saving grace. God actually providing, God actually giving what we can't do in and of ourselves. And it's, it's, it's a paradoxical situation, if you think. I mean, Jesus himself commands repentance and faith. The general call to repentance and faith. Man is, is bound to repent of his sin and put his faith in Christ. But then Jesus also says that no one can come to him unless the Father himself draws him. Right? So we're in this, this difficult place where God's saying, I have to do something, and Jesus is saying, I can't do it unless God provides. And so we find ourselves on this side of, of having come. What that means is that God has given us these gifts. God has given us repentance. God has given us faith. That's how we've repented. That's how we believe is that God has provided these things and gifted these things. That's, that is saving grace. And it's, it's this idea of God providing and God actually saving and providing all of the means by which we even repent and believe and are justified. It's this doctrine that, as we'll see in what maybe Romans 11, maybe what, 13, 14 years from now? Um, we're going to be in Acts. We're all going to die in Acts and Romans, like maybe Hebrew. You're doing better with Hebrews. We'll be old men. Um, but this teaching is what the book of Romans like climaxes in, is, is God's sovereign grace and God's ability to save and how he saves. I mean, at the end of, of this discussion, Paul says, for by him and through him and for him are all things to God be the glory. This is, this is a glorious salvation that we have. We're not saved because we're in any sense better than anyone else. God just saved us. God saved us. God provided for us. So the apostles again here are reminding the Jewish leaders of their blasphemy of crucifying the Messiah. And they don't leave out the witness of the Holy Spirit against them. Verse 33 now. When they heard this, when they heard the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when they heard that they had crucified the Messiah, when they heard that the apostles were witnesses, when they heard that the Spirit of God was witness, when they heard this, they were enraged and they wanted to kill them. Now, now again, I'm kind of jumping back again to what I just talked about. Speaking of the grace of God, if you remember from back at Pentecost, back in Acts chapter 2, there Peter gives the exact same presentation of, of what had occurred. He talked about the death of Christ. He even talked to the Jews there that they had nailed the Messiah to a cross by the hands of godless men. You remember that same phraseology? But in that instance, in Acts chapter 2, God poured out the gifts of repentance and faith. If you remember, the response of the people was, what must we do to be saved? The conviction was there, the brokenness. They wanted to... They wanted to believe in, in Christ. But here, with the same exact language, same presentation, same uh, mentioning of guilt and condemnation, these sinners, the Jewish leaders, with the same message, they respond with hatred. They respond with murderous intent. They want to kill the apostles. And so it's interesting that God here, very justly so, obviously does not give the same grace to these Jewish, Jewish leaders. He doesn't pour out his saving grace on these men, and so they remain hard-hearted and, and, and evil. But the, the high point, nonetheless, is that it does seem there's, that there's some common grace given here to 
at least one member of the council. Common grace is just a kind of phrase to kind of distinguish from saving grace. It's, it's a grace of God that God gives for the benefit of man to help him overcome his total depravity, and his evil mind, and it gives us the ability to do things that are right and good. Although it's not a saving grace necessarily, but common grace, a little grace is given to this man named Gamaliel. And so verse 34, I'm breaking out as another section here. This is Gamaliel's counsel. Gamaliel's counsel. Verse 34 describes him. It says, but a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people. He stood up and gave orders to put the men outside, put the apostles outside for a little while. Verse 34, uh, 35, and he said to them, he's speaking to the Sanhedrin, he's speaking to this council, he says, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. Take care what you're about to do with these men. So, there's some grace given here to this man, this man Gamaliel. He says, take it easy, slow down. Um, this is, if you're not aware, this, this Pharisee is ironically the, the same one who has discipled a, a one Saul of Tarsus, Gamaliel. But I, but I say this grace given to him, this argument he's going to make is, is simply common grace because his defense of the apostles, as we're going to see here, is, is going to be something, uh, well, it's, it's Common grace, because it, his defense is not going to be, we should be careful what we do with these men, because they were with the risen Messiah. These were the followers of Jesus, and we need to be careful what we do. We need to support these men. That's not his argument. If that was his argument, I'd say that might be the more symbolic of saving grace in this man's life. But Gamaliel really gives more of a, a pragmatic argument as we'll see here. He says, take care what you do with these men. In the verse 36, his first argument is, he says, for before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. Now, Gamaliel's argument is going to be, he has a couple of examples here of failed movements, failed revolts, failed uprisings that have happened, that have kind of sprung up in the past. And he's arguing that the Sanhedrin should really move with caution, not be too rash, so that they don't kind of unnecessarily become the bad guys in a situation with the people that might just fizzle out on its own anyways, right? Why become the bad guy if you don't need to be? Maybe this stuff will just fizzle out. But this first example here from verse 36 that Gamaliel mentions, this is the interesting example because, as many have pointed out, uh, a lot of people claim that this is a, a historical error in the Bible, this revolt that he's mentioning by this man, Thutis. The reason this is an issue is because the, the situation happening here, the apostles before the Sanhedrin and Gamaliel's speech here, this is all happening very early, 31, 32, 33 A.D., right? Very early on um, in church history. That's when this scene is taking place. But the, the many who are making this accusation that this is a historical error, they're assuming that this revolt, this Thutis that Gamaliel's mentioning is the Thutis that Josephus mentions in his history, which Josephus... Josephus mentions a Thutis uh, leading this revolt in the early 40s A.D., and he even links it to the rulers that are in place at that time, and so there's this historical timing that can be made for this revolt of this Thutis. So Josephus says this, this Thutis, this account and this revolt of Thutis actually happened a decade after this scene is occurring. Um, how might... How might you guys maybe respond to that kind of claim by somebody saying, well, I mean, we know the Bible's not, the, we know it's not inerrant, we know it's not the Word of God. I mean, it's just a 
history book put together by man. They make historical errors. Here's one right here, obviously. Josephus says this didn't happen until a decade later when these guys couldn't have possibly even known about that. So obviously Acts is written much later, right? And re, you know, all of that, that whole jive. How would you guys maybe respond to that claim if somebody put you on the spot? Have you ever heard that? Has anybody ever heard that claim before, that one? That's a, like a new one? I was waiting for you guys to give me a good answer. No. What would you say? Yes, sir. I guess I'd say Josephus was uh, uh, just a, uh, well, a pagan, but he was a historian doing the best he could with little snippets and bits and drafts, but he had second and third hand from various sources. Right. Back in the day before there was very much even written down, let alone the kind of information system we're used to plus, right? So right. Right. Sure. I like, I like that answer. That was my number one response right there. Why, why are we assuming that Josephus is right and the Bible's wrong, right? That seems to be always what the skeptics, skeptics do, right? The skeptics always assume the secular history is right, which is funny. I thought about this driving here. I'm like, Pretty much all of secular history is secular historians arguing that previous secular historians were wrong about this, that, and the other, and that they have the more accurate date and they're updating. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, history is all, it's never like, they're never sure. I mean, that's what professors do is they write papers on, oh, we found this, and it's a more accurate description of this. Cha-. You know, so why don't, why do we just assume that here that the Bible's in error and not Josephus? Josephus was definitely fallible. There's definitely historical errors that you can point to in Josephus, actually. I didn't write any of those down or note them, but people definitely have issues, like secular historians have issues with Josephus' account. Right, so, yeah, why are we assuming that Josephus is inspired and and could not be wrong? Now, anybody else? Jason, were you going to say something? Thutis? I think I'm saying that right. I don't know. Yeah. So I'm kind of wasting my time up here. You guys know exactly all this already. That's my that's my number two. My number two is, and this is how we should approach it. We assume the word of God is right. And the word of God is true. And that honors God by questioning it or kind of trying to be neutral in your approach to the Bible. It does not honor God. When God speaks, it's right. So there was obviously another Thutis, right, that he's referring to. Now, to kind of support that idea, um, and I think I've mentioned it before, uh, but Gleason Archer has a book called The Encyclopedia of Bible uh, Difficulties. I recommend everybody, you can get it super, it's used, you can get it cheap off Amazon, probably like five, ten bucks. But it's a, it's an encyclopedia of Bible difficulties, and what he does, he goes through all the difficult passages throughout the whole Bible. So maybe in the book of Acts, I think he has maybe five to ten different, you know, problem passages that people have questioned, or, you know, and he just kind of works, walks you through it. His argument there is that, well, obviously there was another Thutis. Uh, the revolt was only 400 men, so it wasn't so big that, you know, it might be documented, you know, everywhere in history that Josephus would have known about, or anybody else for that instance. 400 is not a huge revolt, but there was obviously another re- revolt, and he talks about the commonality of the, the name Thutis, um, how that's a common name. It's, it's a common name just like the next name, just like the next name Judas, uh, this next revolt that's going to get mentioned. So there definitely was a lot. It wasn't one Thutis, so if the, you know, um, so, so anyways, you guys were spot, well, Gleason Archer actually, actually also notes the possibility, uh, Theodorus was another, uh, revolt that happened in 6 AD, 
And he's saying Thutis could just very well be a short for that, that name of that previous revolt because the names, Gleason Archer, um, who wrote this book, I think he knows like 13 Semitic languages. Um, the only reason I know that is because there was a debate that occurred um, years ago where this, this Christian apologist was making some argument. He was arguing against the Muslim Shabir Ali and Gleason Archer was in the front row and he was making some argument about the Arabic and he said, he, he called the Gleason Archer in the crowd and said, isn't what I'm saying correct the way I'm in, interpreting the language issue here? And Gleason Archer like affirmed it and that was like the end of the subject. So yeah, Gleason Archer is an interesting, interesting guy. But yeah, it, could have, it obviously was where well, there was another Thutis. No necessary biblical, uh, you know, error here. It's just what I would say. It's just unbelief and the desire to find error. That's all that is, is when you assume the Bible's wrong. So what about Gamaliel's next example? Gamaliel gives another example, verse 37. He says, after him... After Thutis' revolt, he says, after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. But he too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So, in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it'll fail. But if it is of God you will not be able to overthrow them and you might even find yourself opposing God. Now, to me, this, this whole argue, argument of Gamaliel sounds more like Pascal's wager than conviction of the Holy Spirit that these apostles are true and right in what they're, they're preaching. But the Lord uses the reasoning of Gamaliel to to in a sense spare the lives of his apostles. He uses this. Because it says here at the end of verse 39, speaking of the council, it says, so they took his advice. The council submitted to this argument by Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a very honored, high respected member of the Sanhedrin, even though he was a Pharisee and, and, the, and the Sadducees were at some, at reigning at this juncture in history. They were kind of the prevailing political group, I guess you could say. But they took his advice. So verse 40 says, And when they had called, called back in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now that's, that's kind of interesting to me is that Gamaliel gives his speech. They submit to it. So they bring the apostles in and beat them anyways. It's like that. They don't seem too convinced, I guess you could say. So they beat the apostles, and this was most likely, um, the commentators believe, they probably most likely uh, dealt out the 40 minus 1, the, the, the flogging, the lashings. And this is all the apostles. It's not just Peter. It's, it's constantly been speaking in the plural. The apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin, and they were given the 40 minus 1. They, they give you... 20 lashes across the front, they roll you over, they give you 20 lashes across the back. Um, many people have died just from this, this punishment. It's brutal. But the apostles now, all of them, carry in their bodies the marks of Jesus Christ at this point, right? Because you will scar up. It's opening you up. You're, it's brutal. But I just put the little note before you kind of condemn uh, this kind of punishment in your mind as being like barbaric or evil. Uh, the, 40, the 40 lashes was a command from God back in Deuteronomy 25, 25. So there is a time and place for severe punishment, obviously. God commanded it. Um, it, 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 was, it was kind of like a general punishment given for just uh, different punishments that could be dealt out by a judge uh, when, when there was uh, law breaking. So I just put the note, the sin of the leaders is, is not the prescribed punishment, but the fact that they're punishing the righteous. So all the apostles are flogged, the flogging's handed out, 
The apostles at this point are surely a bloody mess. They're surely in agonizing pain. Can you imagine? I mean, I don't know that I've ever felt anything. I mean, I've had kidney stones, which they say is worse than having a baby, ladies. Um, But what is that, like a million kidney stones at one time? I mean, what is flogging? I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, a spanking, you know what a spanking feels like. It stings in one little place, but it's not ripping your flesh open. It's not all over your body. Imagine for, what, days, weeks, you can't even sleep. Well, I'm a side sleeper, but... I mean, you're, you're all over. You're just messed up. You're all messed up. So think about the apostles there. We must obey God rather than men. And they get lit up for it. They get flogged. Verse 41 says that they left the presence of the council rejoicing. They left the council rejoicing Rejoicing in what? That they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Can you imagine? I said, behold the grace of God. Behold the grace of God to count it all joy when... When I think of various trials, I don't think about being flogged. But they were flogged. They had the grace of God to fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And they have the grace of God to live out Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. And following, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice! And be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the apostles get to join the ranks of those who came before and were persecuted for Yahweh's sake. And it says in verse 42, And every day, every day, which must include the next day, In the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. They did not cease. They were faithful. So, this is where we are in church history. Early church history. The Lord has risen. The Lord has ascended. The Lord has sent the Spirit of God. The apostles had began to preach and proclaim Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. They've already been arrested three times now. They've shed blood for the name of Christ. And despite all this persecution, they do not cease to continue the mission. They do not cease to continue preaching Christ. Any questions or comments about kind of like just where we're at in the book of Acts maybe like what's the takeaway of where we're at at this point yes sir Right. I agree. Who knows, like, maybe he was trying to be very judicial and diplomatic in his approach. Maybe he was convinced, like, you know, some of these Pharisees were like secret believers, you know, like you see in the Gospels and stuff like that. Maybe he was trying to protect them and he just thought by giving this argument, you know, it would get them out. I don't know. That would have been interesting if the inspired church history would have included that, right? Like, he was actually trying to protect them by giving this argument. He knew what would work and so it it worked in a sense. I mean, they still got flogged. I I wouldn't thought that as a victory, but... Um, they didn't kill them. It says they wanted to kill them. 
So they very well could have just probably more easily brought all of these guys before the Romans and said, crucify them, right? Because Jesus was just one guy, right? Maybe well, how much could just one guy do? Well, no, this is a whole, there's hundreds of people at this, the thousands, we've already, what, counted 15,000 converted? This is a massive movement. They could have very easily made the argument, hey, they're preaching another king, crucify them. They could have easily had, I think, made one that day and so Gamaliel does get them out of it. But yeah, it's a very neutral. There's no conviction, like I was saying. You know, like Pascal's wager is like, well, we should believe in Jesus because if it's true, then we're good. And if it's not true, then, you know, none of this really matters and we just die and, you know, nothing happens. That's Pascal's wager. There's no, there's no f belief in the reality there. You're just kind of placing a bet, taking your chances. We're not taking our chances um, God has fully revealed himself since the beginning of time. I mean, there's no question about who Yahweh is. There's no question about Jesus being his son and fulfilling all of the Old Testament scripture. I mean, it's not a, it's not a percentage game here, right? That's the only reason these guys would go out rejoicing after being flogged is being fully convinced of who Jesus Christ is. So, Again, I think, and we're so early in the book of Acts, but the more I think about it, it's like this is just the story of Acts. Like as you go, just persecution and faithfulness, persecution and faithfulness. Like this is the picture that God's saying, this is the Christian life. Persecution, remain faithful. That's it. And so, man, it's a long book, and a lot of that, I think God ha wants to fully convince us uh, that we need to be ready to be faithful despite what comes. We pray that this will just be one more, one more encouragement to you guys. Let's, let's pray. Well, Father, that is my prayer, Lord, that you would use your word as sanctifying grace, Lord, that it would settle in our hearts and our minds just one more time, Lord. We need, as so many just so easily fall away, Lord, and compromise, Lord, we don't want to be those. We want to be numbered with the faithful, Lord. We want to be associated with your prophets, with your apostles, with the true followers of Christ. We want to have great reward when we enter into heaven as these men certainly gained by their suffering and their faithfulness. Lord, help us to encourage one another. Lord, help us to be there for one another when this happens. Lord, they weren't doing this alone. Christ suffered alone. The apostles had each other. We thank you for this church. Lord, we pray you'll keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.